where hundreds of objects and ideas and people compete for our constantly stretched attention. And no matter how many of them we get to, and we're nothing if not active and productive, there are always so many more left by the wayside. Articles we had intended to read, but never got to. My current feed, I think I have 480 articles in my feed that I can't bear to just delete out of there. I know I'd want to read them eventually. Uh, essays to write that molder half formed in file folders. I don't know. Uh, search your own souls. I have about 10 or 15 of those. Um, rabbit holes of links and tabs and tumblers we always intended to cut a path through as soon as we had the time. They become waste when they inevitably overtake us, when there's no hope of us sifting through all of them and giving them the attention they need or deserve. But these aren't like piles of material trash. What kinds of places do these digital bearings constitute? If they are archives, or if they're maps pointing us toward our future interactions, they're still also as much a wasteland as every other map or archive is. They're deep repositories of personal and collective history and memory, but only occasionally used, only occasionally important. The rest of the time they sit ignored in silence. It would be easy to treat this as just a species of the overabundance of the object world we've always inhabited, no different from the unread stacks of newspapers and New Yorkers, or the piles of books to read, or the loads of laundry that need to be washed, or the groceries, or the backlog of all of our work. And in a certain material sense, it remains the same. Just because I have 40 tabs open, or however many you have, look at your laptop right now, or 17 half-written documents are posted on my computer, rather than having them spread out on the floor in front of me, that doesn't make them any less material or any less real. They're as earthbound as anything else, and subject to the same material pressures. Digital waste is not freed from the realities of material existence. It consumes energy, labor, resources, time, and space, just as all the proliferating garbage of the pre-digital ages did and continues to do. And as such, it's inextricably bound to political, economic, and social crises, just as our material waste has been. But for the moment, I want to consider how these spaces are also radically different. And this is where things like the desire for inbox zero or the calls to simplify your life, or to pare down your digital footprint as if it's somehow separate from your life in general these days, seem to miss something incredibly rich and important about how our modern lives actually work. The ability of digital detritus to present itself as more expansive and clean to us means that it can also serve as a mechanism for rethinking our relationships to waste, time, memory, and the self. Tab flab, fave holes, document dumps, they are all kinds of wastelands, but they're wastelands of a very unique kind. Historically, our relationship to all the many discarded bits of our everyday material lives have been one of the abjection and removal. Traditionally, trash, as soon as it's classified as such, is wiped from sight and often from memory, at least for those of us with reliable garbage service. We decide what we want to keep around and what we don't. And the stuff we don't want gets tossed to the curb. And we hope and assume, naively, that it's carted off to some enormous, invisible dump somewhere and more or less erased from our daily lives forevermore. Those collective mountains of rubbish out there speak volumes about the kinds of modern lives we're living, but unlike our digital wastelands, that accumulated garbage is generally left to its entombment, unloved and largely unconsidered by us, invisible, mostly forgotten. The more precarious your life, of course, the less sustainable that fantasy of entombment and clean expulsion is, of course. Every breath of toxic air you breathe, every drink of polluted water, every handful of soil, reminds us that our trash always comes back to us, just not always to us specifically. Uh, in his long essay about taking out the garbage, Italo Calvino, and yes, he has a very long essay about taking out the garbage, uh, he described the process of taking his household trash out to the curb for the garbage men as the transformation of waste from the private to the public sphere. And thus, for Calvino, this is a kind of ritual gesture that reminds him of the importance and value of the social compact, or what others might just call civilization. It allows him to valorize the garbage men who pick up the waste of his and everyone else's individualized, industrialized lives of consumption. Garbage men, he claims, are, quote, emissaries of the thonic world, grave diggers of the inanimate, heralds of a possible salvation beyond the destruction inherent in all production and consumption, liberators from the weight of time's <coughs> detritus, ponderous dark angels of lightness and clarity. Now, I love Calvino's Bearing in the Trees and if on Winter's Night a Traveler and all that stuff, but with all due respect, this claim of Calvino strikes me as kind of a load of horseshit. Uh, but it strikes me as horseshit for a very particular reason, because elsewhere in the essay, Calvino makes the much less sophisticated sounding 
but I think for a truer claim, that our trash is basically like our feces. Calvino takes out his trash every day, as he says, not just out of a natural concern for hygiene, but so that on waking up the following morning, he says, he may begin the day fresh and new. Waste for him is a disgusting remnant of things we processed, and now we want or need to expel, to separate from ourselves, and our sense of the proper boundaries of ourselves. And this is how many of us feel about our garbage. But there's so much unsaid here about the abject, about the social or political meanings of our abhorrence of the odors and sights and substances of decay, of our desire to offload to some vague public our private rubbish, and to do it without giving further thought to it most of the time, over and over again. As Galvino says, this is a rite of purification, the abandoning of, quote, the detritus of myself. Uh, through this ritual, he says, I confirm the need to separate myself from a part of what was once mine, so that tomorrow I can identify completely without residues, he says, with what I am and have. This gives us, I think, the best definition of what waste actually is for many of us. It's not a certain stage of an object's life cycle. It's our specific affective relationship to an object. Once desire has been squeezed out of it, we're left with the waste products of those desires. The thing loses its thingness and becomes something to eliminate. But really it becomes something for someone else to eliminate for you. And it's not actually abandoned and scrubbed from the world, just from your world, more or less. It still ends up somewhere, but by then our romantic sense of the fresh and unencumbered clean self has moved on. Uh, while this is a pattern of consumption and abandonment many of us are guilty of, waste making, I would argue, doesn't only work that way anymore, at least where the digital parts of our lives are concerned. We finish with things all the time online. We close tabs in some of them, in windows after we finish reading them. We throw some old documents in the trash can, or trash can. We delete unwanted files. Chats eventually end, <laughs> depending on who you're talking to. Uh, feeds get cleaned up, if you're better at it than I am. But more and more, they don't. They don't really fully get cleaned up. You never get ahead of it. Uh, based purely, this is totally anti-sociological, I'm an English prof, not sociology. Based purely on anecdotal evidence from many people I know, the information age is making digital hoarders of all of us. We're compelled to hold on to more and more virtual things we do not have the time or energy or space for. I remember when that was just books that I piled up before I could ever hope to read them. Now it's everything on my hard drive. Um, but the ecological considerations of this aside for the moment, the claim I want to make is that in some ways, this can also be a good thing. Uh, efforts at reducing digital clutter, like Inbox Zero, streamlining your Twitter feeds, defriending, unfriending, unplugging, all these efforts, I think, misunderstand how the practice of everyday life online, which is to say everyday life, period, is by its very nature even more wasteful than the disposable post-war consumer culture that digital natives were born into. There are many productive things that asceticism or a more Spartan lifestyle or eco-awareness can do to shape how we think about and enmesh ourselves in digital waste. Uh, but we need to make sure we're not ignoring or downplaying the fact that other notions of waste and value have also been as radically reshaped by the digital age as communication, <coughs> social relations, commerce, and labor have. Most importantly, these digital midden heaps are, I think, major aids to memory, new forms of journal keeping and self-discovery and self-rediscovery. They are potentially, at least, deep archives of many of the collective energies and ideas and exchanges that are bound to our specific personal and cultural moments. This is just one of the many reasons why tri-generational arguments about the horrors of this new technological age don't really hold up to scrutiny. We see particularly stupid forms of this in the claim from some quarters that kids these days have their hands welded to their phones, their faces buried in their screens. Well, not just kids. When you look around you, we're, we're not kids anymore. We're still doing it. But their attention is everywhere other than where they actually are, right? As if this is not part of our life now, right? Uh, but what were these critics and their parents doing? Honestly, let's look at what they were doing. They were staring at millions of hours of crappy television for the last 60 years. They were spending millions of hours clogging the freeways in their precious individual automobiles. They were spending trillions of dollars and hours wandering the shopping malls and retail centers, consuming and dumping, desiring and forgetting, importantly, all the byproducts of that age of affluence as quickly as possible. The culture that created the automobile and the interstate and the suburbs and the strip mall and the 401k chastises the new culture that spends huge chunks of its time on their iPads where, guess what, mostly we're in active conversation and engagement with other human beings, which is the part that always gets neglected in those 
disparagements? And what are the corresponding wastelands that each of them have created? The pre-digital generations irradiated huge chunks of the planet, they plasticized the oceans and the biosphere, they littered the earth with the discarded remnants of decades worth of cheap disposable goods, and yet it's the millennial age that somehow described all the time as acting frivolous and wasteful. When in fact, if anything, recent history seems to indicate that many of us, now ourselves, are the waste product of an era of economic expansion that is rapidly coming to a close. In the meantime, we're drowning, or at least treading water, in our sea of information and our ballooning social relations. If we're all familiar with FOMO, everyone knows that, fear of missing out, right? We're perhaps less familiar with what we might call photo, it's just a working name, fear of throwing out, uh, but it's just as real and just as important. If FOMO is grounded in the anxiety many of us feel in trying to keep pace with social media, information economies, and social interaction, fear of throwing out is the other side of the coin. There are so many good websites, journals, articles, writers, artists, causes, issues, conversations, storifies, chats, tweets, feeds, that's how I feel anyway, that's how most of you in the room feel. So many good things that even among the many that we do get to, it's not uncommon for us to feel a sort of residual attachment to them, even when we're supposedly through with them, or when their time or circumstance has passed us by. It's not an instant nostalgia for the conversation flood so much as a kind of a wake that our frenetic lives create as we move through them. But this wake lingers, unlike earlier generations. If earlier generations dusted off old photo albums or shoeboxes filled with letters, what's likely to happen now and in the future? We still do our fair share of those things, too. But more importantly, people aren't going to suddenly quit caring about and obsessing over the past just because we have devices that allow us access to mountains of information in an eternally streaming present. Those pasts, recent and distant, are just going to be accessed and integrated differently by us. The fear of throwing out predates the digital age, but it's more alive now than ever. With so many things to keep up with in the eternal present of our contemporary lives, we're having to become more and more sophisticated curators, not only of the things that are precious to us, but also of our daily process of emptying out our desires toward things over and over again. What is that feeling of scrolling through old status updates, old fades, old tweets, old blog posts? Please tell me I'm not the only person that does this. You guys do this too, right? Yeah. You don't just go on YouTube and watch old videos, right? You do this too. You go through old feeds and you laugh. Okay. Uh, what is that if it's not a much richer memory aid than even the most diligent of old diarists ever produced? When you compare the small stash of objects that earlier generations cling to, even if they only dust them off once a decade, to our relatively constant access to huge chunks of our digital lives, we soon realize that the old unread blog post, the old favorited tweet, the old chat thread can summon up a whole host of memories of days, months, and years past, with all of the associations and thoughts and ideas that come with it. And I mean this pretty seriously. Like, to me, it's the equivalent of, theoretically, Bruce Madeline. Like, just because it's a tweet doesn't mean, from a year ago, from your good friend, doesn't mean it doesn't have associational historical value. Uh, we're reminded of what our friend said about the kinds of things we thought were worth reading or listening to, the pet obsessions we had, the many superficial fads and gossip topics, as well as, most importantly, the more enduring matters. As with all collections of partially discarded objects, these remnants don't even come close to communicating the fullness of their lives, but they persist in us and for us in a way that our weekly curbside material trash never will. These are wastelands that are simultaneously sites of forgetting and remembrance, of desire and abandonment, available to us in ways that are fundamentally different from the object worlds of our homes, where we gather what's supposed to be important to us, and the trash that we put out every single week. By their very nature, these digital wastelands trouble the old distinctions between desire and abjection, past and present, and therefore, most importantly, between old selves and the new self that's constantly forming, not just in the streaming proliferating present, but with the ongoing influences of the digital past that we drag along with us wanted and unwanted all at once. Calvino argued that sloughing off the things you're done with and making a clean break is a necessary daily process of life. But today, after the household trash is gone, there is no simple detritus of myself to discard, especially not now when we're enmeshed in the remnants of our complexly mediated lives. There is no life or self anymore without the residues Calvino gleefully tossed aside each day. Thank God for that. It was very interesting. So I'm looking forward to talking about that personally also.
Um, so up next we have Heather Rosenfeld, um, and she, I believe, is talking about something similar to what is on the page. On the yes, pretty much what's on the page, although with a slightly different title. And I think this order will make a lot of sense, actually, because you're talking about techno trash. I'm talking about smart electric grid technologies, which are um, digital technologies for the electric grid, so kind of integrating in these very immaterial digital worlds that you just talked about with stuff that you really can't erase, like light bulbs. Um, how does this? How does it work? Um, it has power.
and so I examined the changing significance of choice, participation, and capacity building. These three um, norms are crucial to the project of environmental justice, which also includes questions of distribution of pollution and recognizing difference, which includes things like structural and institutional racism. In different forms, choice, participation, and capacity building are also cornerstones of neoliberalism, a form of governance in which the state steps back from different kinds of regulatory actions in favor of allegedly empowering responsible, rational, and enterprising individuals whose social interests are to be understood as economic ones. This, therefore, encouraging choice under neoliberalism encourages a certain kind of participation and capacity building that is more individualist and more market-oriented. On the one hand, neoliberal forms of choice, participation, and capacity building have long been found to exacerbate environmental injustice. On the other hand, neoliberalism can also facilitate political action. As geographer Bondi has observed, aspects of neoliberal subjectivity hold attraction for political activists because activism depends, at least to some extent, on the belief of existence of forms of subjectivity that enable people to make individual choices about their lives. So, turning to Naperville now. In 2009, the city of Naperville received funding from the Recovery Act for the Naperville Smart Grid Initiative, or the NSGI. With this funding, they plan to install approximately 57,000 smart meters and other digital technologies and to develop programs for consumer engagement. And so these are just some of the programs here. Advanced metering infrastructure or smart meters would replace analog electric meters. They measure electricity consumption every 15 minutes at individual residences. So there are also questions about geosurveillance, and that's not exactly part of this project, but very related. Um, time of use billing enabled by measuring electricity every 15 minutes would provide residents the option of paying a lower price for electricity than a flat rate during non-peak use hours and higher price for electricity during peak use hours to even out electricity consumption cycles. Demand response would allow the utility to remotely turn off particular appliances in households for periods of 15 <coughs> minutes at a time on high use days. Renewable energy could be integrated into the grid more easily. Electric vehicle, they were going to provide electric vehicle charging stations. And volt bar optimization is um, a program in which the utility can monitor voltage changes along distribution wires and send out more precise quantities of electricity to consumers. And so some of these can be identified pretty easily as more neoliberal and some of them less so. Advanced metering infrastructure, time of use billing, renewable energy integration, and electric vehicle charging stations transfer responsibility for energy management from the state, or in this case the municipally owned electric utility, to citizens, offering financial incentives for enterprising individuals who choose to engage. However, this is far from the only message. Demand response relies on individuals ceding control to utilities, trusting that this would result in their own benefit. Likewise, volt bar optimization primarily allows utility workers to have more control of the system. And additionally, all of these changes at this point are associated with expectations of producing a more just distribution of environmental benefits and harms, including less reliance on coal and more local renewable energy. So at this point, the utilities' aspirations and plan programs can be seen to do three things. One, they encourage a neoliberal enterprising subject. Two, they enact changes that are not associated with neoliberal governance, but with utility control. And three, they assume that together these would lead to an improved distribution that would be relatively more just. So having conducted two tests of several hundred meters in spring through autumn 2001, or 2011, um, the NSGI planned to install them in mass in 2012. In conjunction with these installations, they attempted to facilitate acceptance and engagement through several public engagement programs and activities, including developing a volunteer smart grid ambassador program, organizing a series of open houses, and hosting a logo competition. And so this is a picture from one of the open houses with the ambassadors. The ambassador program was comprised of about two dozen members who had responded to the utility's call for volunteers to communicate with the broader public about the NSGI. As a collective, the ambassadors presented multiple reasons to be actively involved from the re retiree interested in public service, the businessman advocating financial benefits, to the engineering professor interested in making the parts of the distribution system more responsive to one another, to the renewable energy advocate concerned about climate change. And as with the NSGI's initial plan programs, the ambassador's reasons can be understood as neoliberal, but not entirely neoliberal. They encourage consumers to be informed and enterprising, partly for financial incentives, but also for these other reasons mentioned. The ambassadors were a cornerstone of the smart grid open houses in which, ambassador, in which they would present on different aspects of the smart grid, highlighting in particular how they would affect consumer experience. 
They encourage the self-governing, active, and enterprising individual by modeling them. Again, this was justified not simply with financial benefits and individual interests, but alongside rhetorics of citizenship and collectivist responsibility, and again, associated with distributive benefits for the utility and the energy, energy generation and transmission system it relied on. Um, a similar process occurred with the development of their smart grid logo, so another kind of public participation. Um, after losing their in-house graphic designer, NSGI leaders decided to create a competition to crowdsource the logo. Through this competition, they were able to, one, encourage participation in framing the project and also avoid hiring a graphic designer. Um, they posted over 100 entries online, allowed the public to vote for the top 10, and the city council chose a winner from these. And so some of these, you, you can see really clearly, they emphasize things like individual choice and financial benefits, um, as in the one on the top right and the one that won on the top left. Um, Others emphasized intelligence, as in the middle left logo, a power with a brain behind it. Um, and still others um, emphasized environmental benefits. A lot had trees, like the middle left one. And then some of them were more whimsical. Um, the one on the bottom right, those two heads, or those two bodies with cogs for heads connected. And then the smiling sun, it seems like. Um, so the winner combined the Naperville N, which is their their city logo with a green leaf and the slogan plug into choice. Concerning that, a communications representative remarked that it's a matter of trying to find that kind of common denominator to communicate to, and I found that choice seems to be something that everybody understands and everybody wants. And as shall be seen, they want choice, but they want different, different people want different kinds of choice and they become contested. Um, in response to the Smart Grid project, and a protest group arose called the Naperville Smart Grid Awareness Group in conjunction with other groups around the country which ranged from tea partiers, naturalistic moms, to progressive groups. Um, they voiced concerns about privacy, security, property, government spending, and human health. Concerns about pri privacy and security centered on the accessibility of information produced by smart readers to state parties, hackers, and commercial interests. Concerns about property and spending pertain to the placement of smart meters on residences and Recovery Act funding, respectively. Finally, concerns about human health were premised on the radio frequency radiation produced by smart meters and their embedding communications infrastructures. So based on these concerns, they had many demands, not all of which were consistent with one another. Um, from the least to the most different from the original project, they included conducting additional meter testing for safety, having more opt-out options for the time of use billing and demand response for people who were concerned about things like surveillance, um, terminating the part of the project that involves smart meters but allowing some of the other sensors to remain, using smart meters that communicated with fiber opt optics instead, those people were concerned about health, um, and terminating the project in its entirety and removing all equipment associated with it. Many of these demands can be premised, were premised on a lack of information and a desire to be informed citizens who made informed choices. So again, they're acting as neoliberal subjects. And in doing so, they challenged some of the more neoliberal aspects of the grid, seeking more or different choices in some of these demands. They also challenged some of the less neoliberal aspects, such as demand response. For purpose of this paper, their particular this project, they're particularly interesting because they framed their critiques in terms of desiring more choice than the utility offered, and that they were they were particularly effective in doing so. Um, they gave out um, they gave out literature at the open houses. They marched in parades, they, and they're pursuing a federal lawsuit. Um, as one of, as some of their signs say, I pay the mortgage and I I reserve the choice. And others said, smart meters are unequal to freedom of choice. And so through these actions, they consistently challenged the utility's rhetoric, asserting that the choices of the NSGI were not adequate. Um, in the previous slide, one protester said, if they want it, that's fine. This is America. But I think the same thing should go for people who don't want it. Real choice. That's the city's motto, plug into choice. So they're challenging what choice means. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that one. So the NSGI quickly became aware of protesters' challenges and demands and responded in several ways. They acknowledged dissent, recognizing the NSMAs, the, the protester group, expressions of seeking different choices and different kinds of participation. Though they posed challenges to the more neoliberal aspects of the grid, the result was progr were programs that were in favor, especially in favor of enterprising individuals characteristic of neoliberalism as opposed to other kinds of choice, participation, and capacity building. 
Um, first, in response to desires for more choice, and especially comparison between demand response and the computer's going to die soon, so hopefully it'll be okay. Um, in response to demands for more choice, and especially comparisons between demand response and Big Brother, the utility made changes to demand response and time of use billing. These were, which are highlighted in yellow in the middle. Um, these were originally slated to be programs that could be opted out of, but that consumers would participate in by default. In spring 2012, the utility changed them so that instead they were strictly opt-in. Their stated reason for this was that time of use billing would not be financially the best choice for everyone given different household work schedules. Through both of these changes, the utility integrated new liberal <coughs> governmentality in the form of financially incentivized, economically based choices further into this market than it was previously. Another set of changes involve questions of safety due to potential health effects, um, and I'll be brief on this one, um, which they were tenuously resolved by, off, by first doing testing and trying to situate themselves in established norms, such as um, there's less radiation than a cell phone, there's less radiation than a microwave oven, than a Wi-Fi router, things like that. Um, they wound up offering another individualized solution of a non-wireless meter alternative, Instead of a smart meter, they would offer, um, or instead of a wireless smart meter, they would offer a wired smart meter <coughs> in which utility workers would go out and take the measurements once a month. Um, and the result of this is ambiguous to negative effects in terms of environmental justice. On the one hand, it was an individualized solution, and collective ones were necessary if the people alleging health problems were to be believed. On the other hand, some people suggest that environmentally just technology, for environmentally just technologies, the benefits and burdens should be felt by the same population, something that is the case for this, communi for this digital communication system. In this way, the digital infrastructure can be understood. Okay, so there won't be one final slide because it's just died, but that's okay. Um, the digital infrastructure can be understood as having an environmentally just distribution, one produced through public participation and recognizing different experiences. They subject the public of Naperville to some risk, giving individuals who believe the risk was greater an opportunity to reduce it, though not eliminate it entirely. Additionally, this is where I get to short circuiting choice, and I'll wrap up with that. Um, Additionally, and at least as significantly, foregrounding choice and responsible individuals and hinging more of the grid's programs on largely financially driven individualistic choices had two major effects overall. First, it weakened and de-emphasized the possible distri environmental distributed benefits of the programs that would reduce energy consumed by coal power and integrate in renewable energy. Second, it reinforced the exclusive community focus of the NSGI. Only Naperville residents were included in participation and capacity building, and this was increasingly individualistic. So rather than real choice heralding a potentially radical construct questioning of infrastructural change, these changes in the utilities framing of choice as a common denominator made the smart grid more neoliberal and less just. And so just as a short circuit involves current bypassing much of the circuit and causing an outage, participation and capacity building on the basis of individual choice in Naperville excluded many of them from the network of who gets to choose. And simultaneously, these debates about choice delayed and constrained the working of the network and its now limited benefits altogether. And I'll be done with that. Well, we seem to be having a lot of technical issues in here today. Um, I know, it's weird, right? Um, so I guess I saw PJ ran out there. I'm assuming he's probably trying to find a new power cable or something. Um, oh no, it might work, right? Yeah. But we need D, D, whatever, cable, D something. Oh, that one's great. Cool. Well, maybe we are good now. Okay, we're on to paper three. Uh, let's keep moving so we have plenty of time for discussion. It's already 4.14. So. presenting on behalf of Mel Hogan and myself. Uh, so thank you um, to my fellow presenters. Uh, this has been a fascinating panel. To everyone else who's here in this room, we're competing with sex next door, so, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, so thanks. Thanks for your interest in this topic. I think it's uh, really important. Um, 
So the starting point of my talk today is a relatively simple but charged question. What if we were required to physically store and care for our personal computing devices, such as cell phones, laptops, and iPads, long after these machines serve their intended function? So in such an imaginary, unusable technologies remain both within our sites, um, so our vision and our sites, meaning our personal spaces. The device drawer overflows into the computer closet, spilling residual technologies out into rooms, and eventually our apparatuses drone our abodes. And with the capacity to see and therefore measure our technological consumption, suspend our contemporary cultural fetish with the newness of technology, perhaps. But there's also, however, ecological and ethical dilemmas posed by the production consumption and disposal of technologies. And while it's impossible to offer really um, an exhaustive examination of these multiple and complex issues embedded in uh, the generation of the waste generated by technologies and what I refer to here on in as techno trash, my talk is organized around four points that intersect uh, the environmental devastation brought about by our technological hyperconsumption our means of use, disuse, and disposal, issues that pertain not only to the glut of techno trash specifically, but also to the shaping of the future of the web as well. Within the last 10 years, we've become accustomed to referring to digital devices in terms of generations. The term alludes to a single stage in the production of a particular product, so, uh, the iPhone 5G, for example. But also, and perhaps more importantly, this mode of referencing is no longer a descriptor of just a specific model. Generation signifies newness, novelty, and improvement, and it connotes individual freedom. The freedom to exchange a new technological device with an even newer new one. Any new technology is, already, is always already obsolete. Oh, okay. um, a new laptop, <laughs> cellular phone, tablet, or gaming console, for instance, is designed not only to be improved upon, but these wares enter the market in order to be superseded, or simply put, trashed. Blend technological obsolescence translates into performance upgrades, additional hardware sales, and most importantly, future profits. Within this model of production, the future is equated with economic growth. It's, but so long as the future is measured along economic models, then our future is trash. It's the death drive of the hard drive. The aggressive coercion of a market-based society massaged by institutions with disproportionate power and reach. A study completed by the United Nations Solving E-Waste Problem the acronym is STEP initiative, estimates that the amount of global electronic waste will increase by 33% from the 49 million tons tracked in 2012 to over 65 million uh, tons by 2017. This is the weight equivalent of almost 200 Empire State Buildings or 11 Great Pyramids of Giza. When our disused technologies enter the waste flow, there are a few options as to their placement in the afterlife. Devices are either put into landfills, recycled for reuse, or unloaded in countries like China, Ghana, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Vietnam, where labor is cheap in both the facilities and regulations governing recycling initiatives are lax. This out of sight, out of mind mentality is a duplicitous mode of cruelty or slow violence. It's violence that transpires slowly and out of sight, a lingering violent devastation that is scattered across time and space. Slow violence is corroding violence that is not viewed as violence at all. This is how, for instance, Ghanaian wetlands have become the world's largest techno trash dumping site. Much of the waste is brought in illegally from industrialized nations, uh, and the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Wastes and Their Disposal, it's simply referred to as the Basel Convention, 
is an international treaty established to hamper the transfer of hazardous waste between nations unless it's for reuse. Uh, and so under the terms of the Basel Convention, the export um, of discarded electrical and electronic equipment is prohibitive if it's just to trash it. Um, but it becomes a problem because it's difficult for customs authorities to actually establish whether the equipment is destined for reuse, which it's often um, said to be, or if it's just going to be trashed. <coughs> Uh, oh, my bad, that's the first slide should have been about the future's trash. Okay. As Richard Maxwell and Toby Miller put it, power in media is a dirty business. The authors cite server warehouses as an example of the false sense of environmental security brought on by the dematerialization of digital technologies. The ongoing growth of internet-based computing, which includes streaming video and audio online, and the rapid growth of social media services, will see data triple by 2017, growing from 44 to 121 exabytes. And an exabyte of storage, which is a billion gigabytes, could contain 50,000 years worth of DVD quality video. It's estimated that 2.5 billion people are online, and that number is expected to increase by 60% in the next five years. This means not only an increase in computational devices, but also a greater need for storage offline to support online activities. And data centers, those industrial-sized facilities that house the computer systems that host and store the streams of data we generate, are considered to be the fastest growing component of the global IT sector energy footprint. And energy demand from these facilities is expected to grow by approximately 81% by 2020. Discourses of cloud computing that equate immateriality with sleek efficiency and environmental friendliness muddy the very real and very physical infrastructures required to support big data. What is going on with my slides? Uh, well, Okay, I don't know, sorry, so here we are, personal time is political. <coughs> the choices we make concerning our technologies have impact far beyond our personal consumption practices. Indeed, our technologies are invested in a world wide web of natural resources and human labor. We cannot, in good faith, continue to ignore the realities of the complex global su supply chain of high-tech industries, both for manufacturing and for end-of-life recovery. Nor can we equate the immateriality of data with in environmental sustainability. And as industry players embrace environmental ethics, we need to hone our critical sensibilities and go above and beyond the green agendas imposed by rich nations and Western NGOs. Green IT, or sustainable IT, is the rebranding of capitalism, the death drive of the hard drive, but with a friendly face. The rhetoric of sustainability is perhaps the slowest form of slow violence because it proposes that we can continue to move forward as things are in terms of our global economy as an unobstructed subsystem of the Earth's ecosystems, so long as we make it sustainable. Uh, and as media study scholars, educators, practitioners, and as consumers, we share a responsibility to dig into the numerous layers in which our personal technologies and media practices contribute to a mode of technological trauma and drama that is best described as the trauma and drama of disembodied techno-trash. And this tension uh, is at the core of a new collaborative project uh, initiated by myself um, and Mel Hogan, uh, who's an assistant professor at the Illinois Institute of technology. And in broad terms, uh, the project is invested in knowing techno trash, so both the material and immaterial residues, and finding tangible ways of rendering the indeterminate determinate. And so Theorizing the Web is our first um, public presentation of this work, and it's um, really a launching of the project. Uh, and in the first phase of research, we're soliciting personal histories of technological use. 
uh, disuse and disposal. And you know, we're thinking or conceiving of the project itself as an interface and repository for these narratives and reflections through which individuals uh, can share their own experiences and, and reflect on them. Um, and so weaving together personal accounts of technological ownership, the project speculates on these life cycles of our devices, gadgets, and data, uh, and postulates the environmental burden of technological consumption that's symptomatic of global capitalism. Um, so here is our contact. Oh, you know what, I'll show you. So the project itself, as I was saying, we're um, just launching it, uh, and we're soliciting stories. So if I've piqued your interest um, and you would like to contribute, or know of people that would, uh, so there is an ethnographic component to it, and we're thinking of this as really a living archive of stories, um, but also sort of a, a, in Canada, usually material thinking, what's referred to um, in the United States as material thinking is the discourse in Canada um, in the universities is called uh, research creation. So we're looking at this project um, in terms of, of the creative output that can come out from uh, the methods themselves. Um, so yeah, that's it. thank you. got a little over 20 minutes, so we should have a few minutes for, for questions. So if you have a question, hold on to it. If you're ready, you're ready to here. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll give you a timer. I'll warn you when you got five minutes. I'm going to try and keep it pretty short for... Okay. start by saying this. Um, you should notice at least one thing, and it's that I'm the third author on this paper. Uh, so Wes is the first author. And the other thing I should tell everyone is I've been on buses and trains all day, so I feel very legitimately like stoned right now. <laughs> <coughs> Set your expectations accordingly. Um, so this paper is uh, really an ethnography. It's, um, we're calling it Spaces and Gaps Navigating Mediated Be uh, Beer Culture, Craft Beer Culture. <clears throat> and it's about how our uh, real world experiences have caused us to interact with online world experiences, which have then reshaped and changed both of those experiences. But to start this talk, we need to start at the beginning. Um, and this is a bar, as I'm sure you were able to decipher. <clears throat> this particular bar is in Philadelphia's 30th Street Station. And the lead author on this, Wes Schumar, uh, this is a bar he would go to when he was done teaching, and he would be waiting for his train, he'd sit there and he'd have a beer. And the woman who owns it is this German woman who puts very high quality German beers on her beer list. And as Wes has been going there, he's been noticing that that list has been changing. It's been getting more local, and it's been getting more craft oriented. And because he's a curious guy, he decided to start trying these things. And the more he tried, the more he grew curious about them, and the more he wanted to find out about them. And that led him into online spaces. Um, these are online spaces like, uh, like Beer Advocate, um, or tweeting about the quality of beer to engage a community, to ask questions about it, and also to participate in it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that needs to be said is that Philadelphia has a gigantic beer festival, and I'm sure if you guys are from the area, you maybe know about it, maybe you don't. Um, and Philly, Philly's Beer Week is huge. People from all over the world come, breweries from all over the world come, and there are many, many, many official events, and you get like a book, and you go to all the official events you can, and there's tons of unofficial events that are just bars that are hosting events that need to promote themselves in some way or transmit that cultural information. Um, so this makes Philadelphia a bit of a destination town, and it also culturally transforms um, the beer market in Philadelphia to one that is 
very, very oriented around craft beer. I know we're in like Williamsburg and this town is extremely oriented. This part of New York is very oriented to craft beer. You can't walk into a bar, even like a really crappy, like, you know, fake Irish frat bar without there being at least one or two good locally produced craft beers in Philadelphia, which is good for us if we have to endure that kind of thing. <coughs> um, so, in the process of learning about beers and engaging in a more online community, Wes became a pretty um, active member of Beer Advocate. Beer Advocate started as a magazine and then became a really, really popular website for a community of people who rate beer. Um, this is what G would call a space of affinity, and affinity spaces are where people come together to share an appreciation of a specific culture or a specific idea and participate in the discussion thereof. So this is just one of them, but the beer community gets really heavily organized around Twitter, around blogs, around websites that promote beer, and even around the specific um, brewery websites. The reviews look something like this. Uh, this is a beer that actually no longer exists, but we thought, we're from Philadelphia, we'll put this antiquated beer from Philadelphia up here. Um, it's a picture of the beer, a rating, um, and a rating from the people who run the website, the brothers. And that's one of the ways you can engage the community and inform about a local product or um, something that you've just recently come across. And also interpret your own interpretations based upon other people's. Um, more specifically, the reviews look like this. There'll be uh, kind of interactive descriptions about the quality of the experience and the beer. Um, there'll be more straightforward ones that just talk about the smell, the taste, the sort of mouthfeel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we were all participating in these different levels of consumption and in these affinity spaces. And luckily for us ethnographers, Philly Beer Week rolled around. Um, but we were kind of neophytes at this point. We didn't really understand craft beer in general, and we were trying to get to, we also didn't understand Philly Beer Week, so we were trying to get to all these events and meet all these brewers and talk to them because the other side of this project is engaging brewers and marketing people in, um, in questions about how they produce what they produce and how they capitalize what they produce and how they don't capitalize what they produce. So how important is craft within the craft beer selling community? Um, but we were really blowing it. We would show up at places after the brewers had left we would go to places that were too popular that you couldn't even get in the door. And that was our fault because we didn't exactly understand what was going on. And what was going on was, well, you don't use the book to organize yourself about where you're going to go. What you do is you follow the hashtags on Twitter, you follow the Philly Beer Week feed, you follow all these other things that are really describing the events that are going to occur um, unofficially, where you know the brewers are going to go after they've given their scoop a little talk because um, they don't want to be there much either. We found out, um, and this led to a really lucky experience. We were like sort of downtrodden that we chased the brewers from Firestone Walker all over the city and didn't catch them at all. Um, so we looked up the Twitter handle, being looked up on Twitter where people were going, and there was this great bar in South Philly. And we're like, shit, well, let's go. <clears throat> and we did, and it was very crowded, but we pushed our way in. Um, and we ordered two beers that we had never seen before, which is not an uncommon thing during Beer Week. But they were very good, and they were from a brewery in St. Louis called Four Hands. And Wes took a picture, he started you know, doing a little bit of beer advocating, and tweeting out pictures and opinions. And we were chatting about how good the beer was. And a guy behind us goes, I'm glad you like it. And I thought, well, that's a weird thing for another patron to say. And it turns out that guy was the president and head brewer of Four Hands. Um, so we had a long discussion with him um, that, we, that we likely wouldn't have had had we not been engaged with the sort of online world of describing the qualities of the beer we were just consuming. This is Wes's Twitter feed. Um, it looks exactly like this most of the time. It's largely about beer and his experiences with them. Um, and what we think here is that there is a gap 
that gets closed between the online world and the offline world with um, being able to describe these experiences that you're having very really and very personally to an online audience that can then communicate with you about the experiences they've had that are similar, that can then change the way you appreciate the experience you're having. Um, this is a sort of merging or bleed through of what Bellsdorf calls the virtual and the actual. Um, so what we're saying is these spaces and gaps make new social spaces possible, that the social space you're in is both a virtual and an actual space, and that they bleed through into each other. Um, but we're also interested not only in the new forms of the social, but also in new forms of capital and whether or not they are being capitalistically produced. Capitalistically produced. Um, this is untapped. This is a app you download and then rate beers on, very much like Beer Advocate, but they don't have an app. So one jumped up in its place. <coughs> um, one of the things Henry, Henry Lefebvre points out is that new forms of production need new social spaces to organize that production. And we think of craft beer as a new form of production because it's not exactly um, the capitalist productive beer market, right? It's more concerned with craft and craft trumps profit exclusively, right? So it's more important that you make a very high quality product than you make a ton of product and ship it everywhere to make the most money. And we see this over and over again in the craft community. Um, and there can be arguments made about, well, you know, they don't want to lose their reputation, or if they ship too far, the quality will stop, and then the, the, uh, the brewery name will be sullied, and then they actually will lose capital. Um, but what, what, we th what we think is that these are creating new social spaces, and that there's a sort of move or shift against this, these forms of pure neoliberalism within a craft economy. Cool, I'm gonna wrap up right now. Um, so that these new forms of sociality, these new forms of interaction, form new spaces, and that these new spaces produce something of prosumers, right? Consumers and producers, where producers are actively consuming the products of their competitors, are learning their markets, and consumers are also producers. We got into brewing beer because we started studying craft beer, and that is of such a common thing that I can't talk to someone who drinks craft beer who hasn't at least attempted brewing. Um, so there's this apprenticeship in the community where the people that are very, uh, very experienced are willing to take individuals under their wing and teach them about it. Um, and I guess I'll wrap up with this. Um, these new spaces that get created are what allow these new forms of sociality to occur, these, connect, these interpersonal connections and these forms of experiential reality that couldn't have existed without the bleed or the spaces and gaps of the online and actual worlds of sort of craft consumption. That's all. Fascinating presentations. Uh, your research sounds a lot like mine. So we should talk. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Not for. Not for. <laughs> it's a, no, mine, mine wasn't very interesting. <laughs> well, it just overlaps so well with the tattoo stuff. Uh, oh, oh, word. Yeah, my actual research is on graffiti, so we can talk about that. Yes. Um, who's this? Keep this for questions. If anybody has a question right now, would you like to walk up here, maybe? I guess I'll stay. Put yourself in front of the microphone. If not, we'll okay. catch on. Say something from Twitter. Um, I remember, this might have been from somebody who's in the room, but I'll say it for the benefit of the live stream. Uh, this might have been from somebody who's in the room, something on Twitter was very interested in a lot of these different issues um, as they apply to sort of museums and curation and sort of those kind of on, on archives and those sort of issues. And so I was wondering if any of you could speak to sort of how your work would sort of shed light on that or sort of to discuss other kinds of implications for cultural archiving. Uh, well, I think um, the project that um, that we're working on, really at, at the core of it, is is really about the, the contributions that are being made around um, this idea of techno trash and sort of what's being contributed. Then we'll build the discourse of exactly what that is. Um, so by we're you know we're asking people to submit uh, not only stories but images, whatever it is that it means to them. And from some of the early work. Um, some of the stuff that's coming out of it is um, 
which is we didn't even think about is around coping mechanisms of that people feel really awful about you know having all of this stuff in their homes or wherever just left over um, and they're finding it might be a, a way of talking about it So this is perhaps a bit more of a, an open question to, to the panel, but I can't remember where the quote's from. Um, someone a um, few years ago said that big data is what happens when the cost of throwing something away becomes more expensive than keeping it. Um, and I was just wondering kind of what your thoughts were on, on big data as trash um, and, and whether you know that's, that would be a, a good way of um, Expressing concerns, perhaps, that we have around around it is well, One thing that I'm interested in, as I said, I mean, there, there was kind of a there's a generational interest, sort of running as an undercurrent beneath the things I was talking about. And we haven't yet gotten far enough into history with people growing up online and social media and sharing it. Even though it's starting to pile up now, and blogs are now old and passe, etc. But we don't have like the grandmothers who have a 50-year legacy of like, online life, that will exist at some point, or some weird variation of that. And I, that's one of the things that I'm kind of looking ahead to that I, I find fascinating and interesting. Like I said, if, if our parents and our parents' parents, et cetera, um, through lots of different permutations, they sort of have this smaller and smaller collection of things they carry with them 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I, I really do wonder what sort of data, files, uh, like I said, babes, tags, feeds, what, what are, or whatever versions exist then 10, 20, 30 years from now. How many of those are we going to keep? What's going to be precious to us? Now, for my part, the thing that I was interested in was precisely the fact that this has been something that just makes me just, it's kind of a problem. I get so much more interested in so many more things. So I feel like I have to become more and more curator. Wow, there's so many more cool, interesting people out there to meet than I ever knew before the digital age. It's great, but it's also a problem. So many amazing things to read. There's so many amazing things to keep track of, and that curiosity gets converted into a problem of data. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we've gotten far enough into it yet to be able to think through it. It's, it's an interesting issue. What that archive will look like. Are we all becoming digital hoarders? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we are. But it's hard to say, right? I, I wonder. You know, we'll have probably wait another 20, 30 years to see what that looks like. <laughs> This is a question that I'm more kind of kind of fluffy, so I'm mulling over my mind myself. But I'm interested in um, kind of my own work uh, in the aesthetics of the server space itself, which is heavily invested in um, uh, staging a kind of um, almost laboratory-like sterile environment that divests itself of any associations with, with waste. In fact, kind of discourse of Waste is very prevalent, and then you kind of these sort of environments where it's actually not only anti waste, it has to be an orderly, clean space, which performs the kind of imagined, I guess, um, environmentalism like the, against which you're um, speaking about. Um, parallel to that is this idea of um, memory, which is heavily kind of emotionally invested. Um, and it's not necessarily, you may call it waste, but some waste is. It is kind of strange, um, sacred almost keepsakes, which exist in various forms. Um, so my question, I guess, I, I always want to ask what, what kind of questions would the panels, panels ask of one another, but um, I'm also interested in kind of the heavy commercialization of this type of, of this type of waste. We are uh, we're not necessarily making these uh, decisions to hold down or to discard uh, these types of materials. And especially around the kind of idea of, I feel like the, <coughs> the keepsake element of this is kind of securitized in a way. We are encouraged to hold on to a lot of this material through this discourse of security, and it could be rationed up to kind of the levels of national security. Um, so even the server, um, the service in which a lot of this information is hosted, no longer is it really on the personal computer. For instance, Dropbox is a kind of this widespread cloud environment where I host my personal important or relevant material 
but it doesn't necessarily belong to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my my personal ownership is in this material maybe is emotional, but it's actual sort of property of Dropbox. How will this uh, environment change when companies go out of business? When um, you know the personal trash and corporate, uh, you know, my my trash, somebody else's treasure, kind of inter intertwine in complicated ways. Curious and kind of yeah. and a cheeky response would be like, yeah. "Well, they can just keep selling our data, so they'll never go out of yeah. business." Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's there's a, a the personal public again is, is being reframed in different ways depending on you know which server, which corporation. It's you know, I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering what Brian think about something like this because there's a commemorative aspect of my own yeah, I mean, have a heavy... Yeah, I mean, I think that's a whole other issue in this that these things we have. I mean, one difference that, you know, the stuff that Grandpa holds on to for 60 years is he has the thing in the box right. and it's all rusted and corroded, which is, you're right, where this idea of ownership uh, doesn't really pertain to us in the same way. So I say, oh, this is my old doctor, my tweets, or my whatever. Not really mine at all, and you're absolutely right about that. I don't know what that's going to do to change our affective or emotional relationship to it. Um, I think it will remain to see what what happens to those things, mm -hmm. right? Who who gets those different things now? Now we we see some of this stuff starting to happen in recent years. You know, the most high profile thing being what happens to someone on Facebook when they either pass away about their page, etc. About what gets released or doesn't, and who has access to it. But then, yeah, now these you know, Dropbox. You know, I hear about Conley's Rice all last week because Dropbox and then he's devastated about that and then how that changed their whole idea of that archive and everything. Oh, I so I heard about it. You should yeah. like that. Didn't Conley's Rice? Do you think she's going to become like a someone who has a board? Yeah, she said, yeah, she became like the new board the head of Dropbox or board directors. Most people were outraged. And they're like, oh my god, I gotta get off Dropbox now. See, right? So there's this constant like migration and like if, if my grandpa's like, well, I'm having to move 20 times and then, well, okay, I can carry this stuff and carry this stuff. And this stuff is, is this our version of it now? Like, oh god, they just got bought out by Google. Okay, well, I can't shop there anymore. I can't get that. I'm off Goodreads, I'm off Dropbox, I'm off Netflix. I really don't know. So, I, I always feel like we're thinking about things that it seem like there's still so much in play, it's hard to even know what our real relationship to it is. It's, it's, it is really interesting, too. Yes, good question. I guess what I'm kind of interested in then, was being brought into there is this idea of who is doing the remembering. And of course, if our data is getting saved everywhere, it, it kind of becomes irrelevant that we are choosing to save that chat log, or we are choosing to save that, because it's being saved in perpetuity um, by, by Facebook, by the NSA. It exists in, in millions of contexts. There is no forgetting. Um, so instead, because of this way data gets saved, <coughs> the way to which there's tension between remembering and forgetting, or remembering and security, and so we see a range of kind of security type behaviours called not putting it online in the first place, um, like Dana Boyd on te teenagers whitewalling and deleting everything off their Facebook, you know, not putting things on Dropbox or third party servers if it's secure kind of company information, um, and then. What's the sort of tensions there, I guess, between us losing the ability to remember things we might want to remember, or versus um, this perpetual remembering space of somebody else actually owning your memories? That doesn't turn into a question. Apologies. Well, I think it's a really good question. Well, if you drink enough, you forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> Why we need the internet to remember things for us? <laughs> I mean, it seems like we kind of made a devil's bargain. You know, it's like if we want to be concerned about and necessarily have access to all our information and everything, you know, we want to unplug us. But I mean, come on, this is how we communicate with our friends. This is how we do our jobs. This is how we do all these other things. So we can be as interpolated in it as we want. But I feel like a lot of us have just made the calculation to say, for all that. We're gonna put up with it and try to navigate it the best we can, and we we seem to be losing a lot of ground in it. But I think the, the thing I'm most interested in seeing now is how what Google Glass is gonna do, or its variants is gonna do to 
this because that seems to have tapped into a new sort of plateau of resistance for people about the boundaries between what the corporate possession of our public or private spaces. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It seems, I mean, it, we're, we're getting good out of it as well, right? I mean, there, it's not as if it's all just this sort of evil empire that we succumb to. It's, it's the space that we go into and meet each other and interact and politically organize and do all sorts of other things, share information. I think for me it always comes down to what people are aware of and what they know, the transparency. You know, if, if you understand the mechanisms that are in place and, you know, and you're doing it, that's one thing, but if, if you're unaware of that, um, it's a little difficult to this, I think. It feels like maybe the only way to this whole thing about self-censorship, not saying some of those things on Twitter through, and, and what we'll get to the end of freedom of speech, because things right. that you have to think about what we're going to be seeing now, what can be remembered in the future, what can be brought back. You can haunt you ultimately, it's kind of the future self, the haunts the present, which forces you to actually censor yourself. Yeah, I think we're out of time, guys. Thank you.